Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's lecture where we'll discuss eliminative materialism. So we looked at this whole notion that Bostrom puts forth that there's a good chance we're living in a simulation. However, that argument based upon probability is also based upon the assumption that computers would eventually be able to simulate minds, that computers would eventually be able to simulate what we call awareness, consciousness, you know, all the things that we are experiencing. It's under the assumption that computers could eventually simulate what we call qualia. Now, we've looked at various physicalist theories in the past, and seemingly they don't really account for this experience of subjective, you know, the subjective experience that we call qualia. Right? All of these theories had their issues. Right? Behaviorism had issues explaining insincere behaviors. Identity theory and functionalism, they explain mental states as being functional states or brain states, but there's still not really an explanation for what we feel we experience, right? There really hasn't been, we haven't been given a reason to believe a computer could generate, you know, an emotion that's genuine and sincere. That a computer could eventually simulate awareness. Well, maybe, says eliminative materialists, the problem why, or the reason why, these physicalist theories have not been able to explain qualia and mental states is because maybe qualia and mental states don't really exist. For eliminative materialists, they're going to say there is really no such thing as the mind. That there really are no such things as mental states. That seems really odd to a lot of us. Because right now you're probably thinking to yourself about limited materialism. So that means you're thinking. That's a mental state. You may even have a desire that says, oh gosh, I want to fast forward through the video to find out how, why they believe this. Well, that desire is a mental state. Right? You may have an opinion about this already. Like, oh, I can't believe this is true. Well, that opinion is a mental state. But the limited materialists are saying, no, opinions, beliefs, desires, those don't exist. They're not real. They'll claim that they are just an artifact of a folk psychology. Okay, so what do you mean by folk psychology? Well, for a lot of us, it's common to describe behaviors based upon mental states such as, hey, I believe this, or I want this, or I think that. So a lot of what we do, we think, is the result of our thoughts, our wants, our beliefs, all of those mental states. That's why I do X. That's why I do Y. Right? I'm studying really hard because I want a good grade. Um, I put my pants on in the morning because I think it's cold outside, <laughs> right? Um, I wear, um, I drive a car when I get, go to work because I believe it's the fastest way to do it. So in this framework, human behavior is the result of some mental state. The eliminated materialists, such as Paul and Patricia Churchland, believe folk psychology is a little bit outdated. They believe that this way of describing human behavior as being based upon beliefs, desires, and motivations, that's kind of an old language. That's, that's an old, primitive, right, folk way of looking at human behavior. And instead, we should look at, uh, at you know, more recent findings in biology. We should be taking a look at neuroscience. We should take, be taking a look at objective science of the mind, things that you can measure, things that you can test. And if you really take a look and measure and test, you're not going to find this internal subjective thing called belief or an internal subjective thing called a want. And it makes no, there's no use trying to explain it by looking at the brain. There's, there's no reason to explain that thing by talking about how something functions. Let's just admit that they don't exist. 
So let's summarize some ideas here with limited materialism. No such things as beliefs and desires. Do you believe that? Do you desire that to be true? <laughs> they say, if you believe it or if you desire it, you're fooling yourself. Either way. Only physical things exist. Only the brain, the body exists, right? There is no immaterial mind the way we often think about it. When we take a look at folk psychology, this whole idea of looking at motivations and desires, you know, uh, unconscious, uh, uh, unfulfilled um, needs, they say, you know, folk psychology really hasn't evolved as a science. That from Freud and Carl Jung moving forward, we haven't really seen any sort of new findings that give us really any new insights into how to help people. They're going to talk about how when we compare folk psychology, right, a, psychi a psychologist talking to you to get to understand your motivations, your beliefs, your desires, to help you out, when we take a look at that sort of form of therapy, it doesn't seem to be as useful as neurological interventions. I mean, compare treatments for like depression or anxiety and how long it might take somebody to go through weeks, even years of counseling to deal with their depression or anxiety, and how inefficient that is as compared to going and doing some sort of neurological intervention, whether it's taking certain substances or having a certain operation, I mean, science has given us ways of dealing with depression and anxiety that alleviate those issues much faster, much more effectively than going through years and years and years of psychotherapy. And when somebody gets better after psychotherapy, is it really psychotherapy or is it really something else? So eliminate materialists look at these things as reasons to believe that so folk psychology isn't, isn't real. Folk psychology is an outdated way of looking at what it means to live a human life. Now, the obvious objection here is the fact that, no, I feel like I have a belief. <laughs> like right now, I feel like I have a desire. Like right now, I feel like I have a feeling, right? I mean, it feels very real to you that you have a feeling. It feels really real to you to have a belief, doesn't it? I mean, I could ask you, hey, do you believe this stuff or not? And you go, yes or no. Either way, you feel like you have a belief about it. <laughs> so the limited material say, no, that, that feeling of having a belief, that's, that's not real. That feeling that you're having a thought, hmm, no, not real. How do they explain that? How do they explain your subjective experience that it's really real and the fact that they think it's not real? Well, here's a story. Imagine you lived in a culture that believed in these things called fatigues, okay? And every time your a body part feels tired, the, the way the culture describes that is to say that there are fatigues there. So let's say you've been typing all day, right? You'd say to yourself, or you'd say to your friend, holy cow, there's so many fatigues in my hand, right? Or you finish running like a marathon, and then your family comes and uh, asks you, hey, how are you doing? And you go, man, there's so many fatigues in my legs. Now to us, we'd go, there's no such thing as fatigues. There's no fatigues in your hand. There's no fatigues in your legs, right? We can explain all of that based upon, you know, how the muscles work and what you did to deplete the oxygen in them. And, you know, there are other ways of describing what you experience, but there are no fatigues in your hands. Like if you're staring at computers all day and you're watching tons of lecture videos, do you really have fatigues in your eyeballs? In this culture, that's how they talk. In this culture, that's what they believe, that there are fatigues in your eyeballs. It's very real to them. They feel it, right? They're rubbing their eyes going, I feel it right now. What do you mean that I have no fatigues? It's right here. I can feel it. My eyes are full of them. Oh, man. It feels really real to them. For the limited materialists, they're going to say, well, the same thing is true when you say, I believe this, or I desire that, or I think blank. All of those mental states, they're not real. In the same way, fatigues aren't real. They're just your way of describing what's happening. Right? 
So when we take a look at the whole question of artificial intelligence, then if you're an eliminative materialist, well, there's no reason to believe that computers can't also develop, you know, what we call consciousness, what we call awareness. Because since our brain, which is physical, is able to create it, I mean, why can't really, really, really advanced computers? Right? So eliminative materialists say, sure, sure, it's a possibility. Why not? What do you think? What do you think about this perspective on the philosophy of mind? Materialistic, meaning it's based upon the belief that reality is primarily material, and it's eliminative because it eliminates the mind <laughs> as simply an artifact of how we talk. It doesn't really exist. Where is it? Point to it. Can you touch it? No. Point to your feelings. <laughs> Point to your beliefs. Can you measure them? No, maybe you can't point to it. Maybe you can't measure it because they are not there. <laughs> maybe because they don't exist, say the limited materialists. So what do you think? How might you object to the limited materialist? Well, one thing you could do is just continue to pound the qualia idea. The fact that you right now feel like you're having a subjective experience, right? Right now, you feel something. You feel hot. You feel warm. You feel angry. You feel frustrated. You feel confused about all of this. And right now, you have that subjective experience. How can we deny that exists? How can we say it's not real? Another thing you could do is to say, hey, wait a minute. If a limited materialism says there are no such things as beliefs, then doesn't that mean? I can't believe in a limited materialism. <laughs> this is an argument from self-refutation. Uh, if you're clever, you might be able to think of a way to respond to that too. And then how about three? You know, all of this stuff from the physicalists and especially the limited materialists, they're all based upon a certain assumption about how to know something. Right? They're all based upon the assumption that the only way to know something is to be able to see it. But is that really the only way to know something? This is a question of epistemology. How do you know something? How do you know what you know? How can you justify knowledge? And this is what we'll get into in our next lecture.